Uh, can everyone no, hear I me? I cannot see it. Hi. Um, uh, so, uh, name, that is a uh, we're starting this workshop very soon, so please put video. on your headsets. Okay, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, welcome to Workshop 119, Defining the Successful Factors for Youth Participation in Internet Governance. I'm a Bianco and I'm a Namishan Ambassador from Hong Kong. Uh, I'll go through more about my organization later on in the comparison that we're going to do. So um, in this specific workshop, we're looking at youth engagement programs in Internet Governance and outside of Internet Governance as well, especially focusing on the practical sustainability of youth participation. So within Internet Governance, we have a, a lot of um, programs lined up, so I'll, I'll give you uh, a brief introduction. Uh, so for training camps, we have the Dutch student IGF, uh, Anne-Marie Rulens, um, and then ChildNet Youth IGF in the UK, so Lucinda Fell, who is a coordinator, and also Jack Passmore and Rebecca Cawthorn. Um, okay, okay. Um, and also on the competition side, we've got NetY with Pat Chung and Daisy Wong. For the ambassadorship, we've got Net Mission Ambassador uh, myself and Desiree Ho. And also ISOC Ambassador Paul. And uh, ICANN Ambassador, who will be um, joining us remotely, uh, Sunarash Fardaryan. She is an um, ICANN Fellow from Armenia. And outside of internet governance, uh, we'll learn how to engage youth, um, maybe on a political uh, aspect. We've got scholarism, um, the convener of scholarism in Hong Kong, uh, Mr. Joshua Wong. And um, we're potentially looking for a pirate party um, in Sweden, Emilia uh, Andorsetta, who is also the European Parliament's member. So on the panel, we also have William Drake um, right here. He's an international fellow and lecturer of Media Change and Innovation Division. So this aims to be a very engaging conversation. So I know the setting is not exactly engaging because it looks like a classroom setting. Uh, but then um, I hope all of you have got um, this on your hand. OK, so the smileys actually has some meanings. Let me show you now. So for the pink one, it means agree. Um, for the yellow one, it means neutral, and for the white one, it means disagree. So what that means is actually, because this is an outcome-based workshop, uh, what we want you is that after we go through all these programs and understand the mechanics, um, the mechanisms of uh, all these programs, what are the pros, what are the cons, uh, we will then say a comment. So for example, I would say, I think competition is a better way to engage students rather than ambassadorship program. And then everyone, including the panelists, including you, would uh, help us to tell us, oh, you don't think so. And I'll, I'll probably pick on you as like, uh, hi, uh, I would want to know what, why, why do you not think so? So I think that's a more engaging way uh, to, uh, for this workshop. Um, so we really need your opinion to be um, focusing on a great discussion. And let me go through kind of the outline of uh, what's going to happen today. So we're going to have the organizer perspective, uh, the participants' uh, perspective, and also the sustainability. Uh, for the organizer, uh, it's a little more complex, uh, maybe on the design uh, of the program, the format. Uh, for example, I've said ambassadorship, competition camps, the objectives on why engaging youth, and I think that's pretty clear already. Um, and then selection of the participants. Uh, is there any common backgrounds? Why are they involved? Are they working or are they students? Uh, what are the common industries or subjects that they, um, they're studying? And uh, also how they frame internet governance, since it's such a broad topic, um, how to make it relevant to them, or should, should you just give them the flexibility to choose whatever topics they want to choose? And finally, the resources devoted. Um, and I think that's very important, right? How you get funding, uh, what's the manpower, if you have like a specific coordinator who is working on it, and also the collaboration partners. Do you work with other NGOs? Do you work with schools? 
Um, and also from a participation uh, participant standpoint, uh, why did you join it? Uh, what attracts you? Uh, what are the positive and hopefully not too many negative impacts? And um, maybe if there are people, um, so for NetMission, I think it's relevant because there were a lot of people who dropped out. Um, and then maybe um, why, why did they drop out? Or who are the people who are more likely to stay? So I think that those are very interesting factors to look at. And also on the sustainability. So um, how do you sustain this? Is it just a one-off program? Uh, do you have alumni programs? And part from a participant standpoint, uh, why do you keep involved? So I think those will be very interesting things to explore today. So I hope you will be engaging in this workshop. Uh, so let's start now. Um, so let me go to uh, NetY uh, in a competition format. So we have Pat Chung and Daisy Wong. So. Um, yeah, I just, um, I'll just i share a bit more because uh, NetMission actually organized NetY, uh, part of it, and uh, we are sponsored by Dot .Asia and um, YMCA uh, together to be co um, co um, co-organize this uh, competition. And um, so uh, it is, its structure is basically the training. So they have uh, a couple workshops on presentation skills, essay writing skills, because uh, this is mainly targeted for secondary school students. Then they have essay writing and then presentation. So uh, maybe um, any representative from NetY can tell me, what do you think of this um, specific format? Okay, so um, the network competition is an uh, essay writing competition and uh, talking about the advantages of network program, uh, I would say that the uh, essay writing f method is really an effective way to raise the awareness, raise the participants' uh, awareness of internet issues since uh, a convincing essay requires lots of data and uh, during the essay writing, we did a lot of data research on the copyright infringement, and through data research, uh, we have deepened our understanding on the in the, uh, on the copyright infringement gradually. And after we understand this topic, we actually pay more attention on this topic on the internet. So we think that the essay writing format uh, can. Uh, successfully uh, uh, raise the participant uh, awareness. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also on the selection of the participants. So these are actually the winners uh, of the NetWide competition. And, um, and it's through the competition. So what do you think about using a competition to engage students? So um, we think that using a competition to engage a student is quite good because um, we need some um, other learning experience. That, that's the term uh, you can find in Hong Kong education uh, educational system. That uh, we got to find some competition activities to join and enrich our profile to uh, help us to admit to the university. So I uh, think the competition way can. Uh, uh, can prove our ability to uh, stu uh, to to our future study, and the university will depend on our, the other learning experience and choose the uh, student who have ability. So I, I think com competition is quite a, a attractive method to uh, draw more uh, youth uh, participate participants. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. And um, I think as an organizer, I think competition is good, as in the winner would definitely be very engaged, but then there are also the losers. So we had 25 schools uh, who uh, actually participated in this um, uh, competition. And uh, we, just, we, we are still thinking of ways to how to engage the other um, 24 schools that didn't, uh, wasn't able to come. Uh, but then there were a lot of awards uh, at the award ceremony, best performing for sure, but also best presentation and other awards that keep them engaged um, and be rewarded. So um, that's one thing. So on the topics of uh, selected uh, in internet governance, uh, we were actually quite flexible uh, for the children's, uh, students' choice. And we did have four specific um, topics on internet governance and just kind of frame uh, what exactly internet governance since it's so broad. So um, did you find the flexibility difficult or it's, it's actually a good thing? Um. We found the uh, flexibility is quite, uh, quite let the participant quite tough to um, 
think about their direction to write their essay, but after the completion, we think the flexible, uh, flexibility of choosing the topic is really uh, good for the participants, since uh, the contents, the to contestants can choose their uh, topic they like, and it actually can raise their interest in internet governance. So. Also, the uh, flexibility can make the competition uh, become a more diverse, uh, diverse opinions exchange. So uh, that's quite good to uh, have some flexibility in this competition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, on the resources that we devoted, so uh, on top of Dot Asia support, we also partnered with an NGO, a very f uh, famous local NGO, Chinese YMCA. And uh, they also had a very strong school support. So um, does this make it more credible uh, for you? And especially on something so fresh, you know, it's not like usual poverty or other NGO um, out youth outreach programs that are usually conducted. Yes, I agree that uh, the uh, reputation of the organizer, uh, they are quite famous in Hong Kong, like the uh, YMC of Hong Kong. and it uh, it can uh, draw more uh, student attention uh, and encourage uh, and encourage them to uh, participate in this competition. Also, the it's a very large scale uh, competition that uh, which is organized among uh, many secondary schools across Hong Kong, and the student can represent their school to be a uh, contestants. I think this kind of uh, that's all. It's, uh, it's really an uh, attraction. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so let's move on um, to the next uh, program. Um, so we would like to invite Chalmet, uh, Jack Pasmo, and Rebecca um, on their views on the um, on the design of the program as well. So Lucinda will be speaking. Um, can anyone, anyone give her a microphone? So Lucinda, uh, she is the uh, coordinator for ChildNet. So first, I think we'll explore the des design of the program, the format, yeah. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, so this is the fourth year that ChildNet has brought young, young people to the IGF. Uh, we have a team of four young people with us, and we founded our project in 2008 in response to criticisms that there had been a, a lot heard about children and young people at the IGF, but actually they hadn't been present at the IGF. Um, and I think from our perspective, uh, preparation and conversation with young people prior to the IGF is actually key. It's really crucial, and we have to equip them to engage in discussions on policy and we do this at a youth camp um, that we have in the summer. We um, founded our youth camp and we undertake various work. We have discussions with industry, so we've had Google involved, we've had Facebook involved, we've had uh, freedom of speech people involved, we've had uh, the Internet Watch Foundation who block child abuse images in the UK. What we think is really important is to present the young people with a very wide range of topics so that they can make up their own opinion about what they want to speak about when they come um, to the IGF. For us, Youth Camp is about helping them to consolidate their own experience um, and to give them confidence so that they can speak out about their experiences. I think um, there is a caveat that I would have to say about involving young people. Um, this is our day job. We talk about the internet on a daily basis. So it's our language, it's our jargon. And although children and young people do use the technologies on a daily basis, engaging with the language of internet governance and some of the technicalities that we're discussing can be quite daunting and confusing for them. For our project, we work with young people aged between 14 and 18, and we have to acknowledge the fact that they're actually in full-time school education so it's very rewarding for them to come along but they have to make sacrifices and it can be difficult to get them out of schools and there's also a huge um, raft of practical considerations that come into account um, for convening a youth camp and also for taking children and young people abroad, thinking about chaperones that are needed, risk assessments, the right ratio of male to female staff um, on our part as well. But I think the real testimony would be to hear from our young people who are on the panel um, and who can tell you a little bit about what they've got out of being involved and what they found beneficial.
Uh, hi, Lucinda. Sorry, I wanted to know what. Um, how did you select the participants? Sorry. How did you select the participants for um, the Child Net program? Um, we ran a recruitment session in school, so a little bit like the competition. We realised that actually you have to know the young people before you can go away with them because when you're taking them to somewhere like Nairobi last year, there could be some serious pastoral issues. Um, we've all done youth work, but we are I'm a policy person um, and my colleagues work in schools, but we are not social workers. So we really need to get to know the young people. So we ran a day session in a school where we spoke about IG, we we gave the young people tasks. We also spoke to their teachers as well about how they thought they might cope um, in an environment such as public speaking in front of a large, predominantly adult audience, and also kind of the stress of traveling, coping with jet lag, and doing all of this in quite a short frame of time. Thank you, Lucinda. So maybe we can pass um, it to the participants. Um. Um, well, for me, there was a... Um, when I was um, originally picked last year to go to Nairobi by um, by Childnet, um, there was a huge attraction for me with this because it's it's things that I love. I love speaking in public. I love the internet. Um, you know, I'm a digi they call the youth of today digital natives. You know, we've we've grown up with the internet. We're the first generation to really involve everyday life with the internet, and um, we as young people uh, sort of we have a, a, a good perspective because uh, it's it's great um, that. In, you know, it, they talk about internet, internet governance, but um, we attended a workshop last year about um, youth participation, and I was thinking, how can you have a workshop about youth participation in in IG without youth speaking on that panel? So, um, but yeah, we, um, we have good opinions, ideas. They may not be as sophisticated as, as some of the, maybe the adult opinions or ideas that they have, um, but it, it's, it's it's a great attraction for me, and I, I just love doing this this kind of thing. I have to agree with that. I mean, we were when we first got involved, um, it seemed a bit strange to us that I mean, they were talking about oh, um, this change could be made, this will benefit young people, and then we were never finding out about these ideas that could benefit us all. Well, as we found out in a few ideas, <laughs> probably wouldn't. So that's the kind of a personal reason. And also, you can find a lot of advice from being here. You can find out more about what copyright issues there are, and you can pass it on to friends, and you can give more people advice. It gives you a wider span of what you can talk about. Um, and we did a youth camp in summer, we did it last year and this year, and um, that's given us a big help. I mean, as Lucinda said, there is a lot of jargon at this conference, I mean, there's a lot of words that we probably wouldn't have understood. We've built up a dictionary of these words almost at the youth camp, so we've managed to be able to actually learn and be able to understand and participate in discussions that we probably wouldn't be able to unless we went to summer camp. And then uh, leading back to what Lucinda said earlier, there are a lot of challenges for us. You know, we, we are full time. We are in full time education. For me, this year it was a little bit more difficult because I've just started college. I've started my AS studies, which are a little bit more difficult. Um, so, plus fitting in all holidays and hobbies and things like that within this, you know, we, you start missing deadlines both for both for the IGF work and and for school, which is a little bit difficult. But um, coming here and being here for the week and attending all these sessions and being able to chair a workshop this year um, is just so rewarding for us and it's, it's inspiring and it's great fun. Uh, sorry, so I, I just wanted to know what do you enjoy the most um, in the youth camp? Um, I don't know, I think in the youth camp I probably enjoy the most like discussing with other people, finding out a wide variety of views. As Lucinda said, we had a lot of different people coming to our youth camp. We had a variety of, like all of us are from different backgrounds, so it was nice finding out different things about each other. Like. Jack comes from more of a, um, a country background and I come from a very big city. So, I mean, we both have different issues and it's quite nice to be able to discuss that so we have a wider span of different issues, really. Uh, that's great. Um, also, um, I think Lucinda mentioned that uh, you have engaged with Google and like other like, corporates that are pretty well known on the internet. Do you think that would have helped you on like being more engaged? Um, sure, yeah, I think... Um, Especially having this opportunity, you know, um, last year our summer camp we went to the offices of Microsoft and they attended a Google um, workshop the following day. And I think it's quite inspiring to find, you know, these great massive service providers that we hear about every day um, and being able to work sort of with them um, to, uh, to attend a place like this. It, it's quite inspiring and it's... Yeah, it certainly helps. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you a bit of a feel for the environment and what it'll be like here. As you are in the working environment that the people attending here are in, you kind of get to know more about what the feel of the IGF will be like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also on the topics of uh, what you discussed, so is it more on 
Like for example, would would corporates framing frame IG very differently than uh, what Lucinda would have taught you? I'm not sure really. I think I don't know. Lucinda explains everything at the summer camp, and so does everyone else in a way that we can easily understand, and then that can build up and go on to a more corporate level. Sorry, Lucinda. Um, if I come in here, we don't really talk about internet governance at our summer camp. We talk about the different issues that it involves. So when we started out, we were trying to make the issues really accessible. So we, we think mostly about security, openness and privacy and access and diversity. Those are the two strands that we operate in because that's really relevant to what our young people um, tell us their experiences. This year, we've actually only focused on security, openness and privacy based on some of our discussions in Nairobi and actually the fact that the issues that arose in access and diversity for us still came up in security, openness and privacy, so we could cover everything in that. So we've been here talking about freedom of expression, um, social media and teenagers. We've been talking about um, is there a difference between the online and the offline world and is digital citizenship still a relevant concept? Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, next uh, I'll have Anne-Marie uh, representing Dutch Student IGF. So um, can you just, um, I'm not sure of the organizer here, but can you briefly tell me about your design of the program? Yes, hello, my name is Anri. Uh, I will briefly explain what the student IGF is and what we are doing. Uh, the student, uh, student uh, internet debate um, was organized for the second time this year, and it uh, is actually uh, took place in the morning session before the actual IGF NL uh, event. It is a student debate, and uh, it is aimed at informing and motivating students from all different uh, university and who are following following all different courses um, to talk about internet topics and it's important that not only uh, students studying topics that are directly linked to internet or technology um, are uh, able to participate but students from all different courses uh, for example I'm a history student and I think um, that the debate uh, is really aimed at stimulating the discussion uh, on topics such as uh, privacy and the use of Facebook and censorship. Um, the debate really works uh, as following. Uh, experts on these themes um, no, in no more than five minutes explain something about the themes and the issues and then they come with a statement and the students debate uh, on the statement and I believe that this really creates a very relaxed and open atmosphere uh, in which the students really feel free to say whatever uh, is on their mind and I think um, that this uh, atmosphere and vibe um, that's really uh, contributing to the high level of debate uh, that we had this year and um, yeah, okay, that's, yeah it. that's great um, so how about how did you get involved with this uh, I got involved actually uh, through a student organization I was in a board of student organization uh, last year and um, well uh, that's how I got involved okay um, so how about, um, so y you talked about the atmosphere, right? How did you, what are the topics that you actually talked about? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, for instance, uh, we talked a lot about uh, Facebook and that you should be uh, responsible um, for your own usage of Facebook and uh, that your um, data are online and you should, uh, and students should also tell each other uh, that the da their data are not protected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like kind of relevant issues. Yeah, really relevant and accessible issues, so everybody can discuss uh, on these things. Discuss okay. These things. So um, who actually organized the program? Uh, the program is organized by an organization uh, called ACP, and it's a cooperation with the Ministry of Economics. Okay, um, so we, we have um, a person on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was actually, it's Ludo, he, he uh, was uh, the leader of the debate this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I just want to uh, add one more thing actually to what was mentioned. Thank you for what you already explained about the debate. I was the moderator of the, uh, of the student debate. Uh, at the Dutch uh, Internet Governance Forum um, and actually we did a little bit different this year in a sense that we still called it the student debate uh, but we, we decided it was about young people and students of life in a sense so we got a lot of students in from like uh, college obviously but we also had um, you know 
other young people involved which were not necessarily enrolled in college. We thought it was very important to have a, a, you know, a large uh, diversity uh, in the youth group that was involved. And second thing that is, uh, I think, very important is that we took actually um, um, a big effort to bring everything what happened in the morning sessions with the students back into the program uh, that happened in the afternoon, the normal IGF, uh, mm. Dutch IGF session. So I think, uh, you know, it was about diversity as well when it comes to the setup of the, of the workshop and as well implementing what happened in the morning session towards the afternoon session. So that's something I would like to contribute to this. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Do you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, well, I, I think it's important that we uh, students and young people discuss this topic in our own way, a way that fits our age and our creative personalities, and then we don't have to adjust to the adult world and the way they discuss these topics, uh, because we uh, will do it in our own way, and it, that will motivate young people. That's great. So thank you very much. Um, so now we move to ambassadorships program. Uh, so maybe we'll talk about that mission first. Ah, uh, something like right to my heart. It's, it's like uh, she's like kind of my skin. Well, anyways, I'll talk to you, tell you about a little more about the structure. Uh, unfortunately, the um, one of the main program um, coordinators cannot be here, so I'll be talking about the structure as well. So we've gone through um, for Net Mission Ambassador. Uh, they have chosen um, university students, and um, they're actually. Already, we are already running for the, our third year, so there are uh, differences in how we select our participants, and I think it will be a great thing to discuss in the um, sustainability uh, standpoint. So anyways, our structure is that we go through um, a lot of training programs, and then we do community projects. So we basically focus on digital divide, so we divide it into four groups, the youth, um, the teenagers, the women, as well as elderly, and we uh, defined what are the digital divide uh, problems that they face, and then how we can do community projects. So I think that gives us a very good um, basis to understand internet governance from a more um, actual, so instead of just um, discussing, I think actual action is very important. So then I understood actually there are people in Hong Kong, um, regardless it was such a rich uh, country, um, there are people who actually do not have an access, um, access to internet in, on, online at home. And there are a lot of women who um, has a lot of um, debates with their kids because uh, they just don't understand the in internet and don't understand the computer and that's causing a lot of troubles to them. So I think that's something uh, to um, very close to my heart. Um, and also we selected, I think, digital divide uh, because it is a lesser uh, focus uh, topic in uh, internet governance, um, especially in Hong Kong. I think it's not recognized as a social uh, problem. And uh, we, we do have very dedicated resources. So Dot Asia actually sponsored our program. They also have a full-time staff who's running this program. So I think the full-time staff is actually very important. She kind of acts as a coordinator for all the community projects or even going to international conferences like this afterwards. So um, being in the uh, ambassadorship program since year one, um, I actually graduated now and I'm working elsewhere. Um, but I'm still continually involved with this space. So I think it is. Um, it is very sustainable. So maybe I'll let Desiree talk about her experiences as well. Um, hi. So I was in the Net Mission program, and I was helping out with um, a children based uh, community project in Hong Kong and by being actively involved and having the freedom to choose what area of internet governance interested me and using a method that um, that I was familiar with and being able to implement that. I think that's what engaged me into this um, internet governance and that's why I'm still here. Um, I'd like to ask perhaps Bianca, what do you think, um, what do you think keeps us in, in, the, in, the, in the circle, like what, what has kept s some of the ambassadors in the program and whereas some other people after they've graduated, we don't know if that, you know, the sustainability factor of it can keep on? Mm. Uh, I think I'm pretty close with the uh, program coordinator and there are a lot of um, events organized by NetMission, NetY and they always need volunteers so you always show up and that kind of creates a circle like kind of like alumni but not exactly a formal alumni program so I think the people actually kept me going. Um, I think the inspiration that I find in the discussion as well you know are going to IGF if I don't come to IGF I can still uh, participate remotely um, 
or like things like that. I think the inspiration is very different from other topics that I find. Yeah, so I, I would say like compared to the competition model uh, with NetY, that's a very mass education model. So it reaches out to many different secondary school students, whereas um, in comparison, the ambassadorship program focuses on um, like 20 odd uh, students and puts most of the resources into training them into helping them spread the word of internet governance. So I think that's a major difference. Mm -hmm, I agree. And also, we, we uh, a lot of our Net Mission ambassadors, after we do the uh, community project, we also get to go to international conferences. So uh, we've been engaged in AP, NIC, um, ICANN, IGF, and various uh, international conferences. And I think echoing to what NetY thinks, the international experience really is a valuable experience. And I, I believe that would be the same with uh, Anne-Marie. Uh, for the Dutch IGF that she she won actually in the debate and she got to come. So I think that is definitely a big attract factor for a lot of people who still keep engaged in this discussion. Um, so I think that's it for an admission. So let's uh, move to Paul from ISOC um, on the fellowship. Yeah, like can you tell us a little more about your structure and uh, how the fellowship is selected? Hello there. Do you hear me? No. Do you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So I'm sorry about that. Um, the Internet Society is. Uh, is an organization that actually does want to promote participation by young people. But their program actually targets people in the age group from 20 to 40 years. So uh, strictly speaking, it's not for, a, for the very young participants. That is maybe people who are below 18 years of age. So they usually each year call, there's a call for fellowships. And uh, the call for fellowships is an invitation by high caliber, maybe professionals or people within that age group to actually apply. And they select a given number. And usually they, they have different kinds of fellowships. One of them is actually the Internet Society Fellowship uh, as an IGF ambassador, of which I'm one of them. And we are 13 others, I think. And then there's another one to the Internet Engineering Task Force, the ITF, which deals with the development of internet standards. There's also another fellowship to the Technology Forum of the OECD. Usually they choose two of them. And there's one on the World Bank of Dev, InfoDev Fellowship, which is also an ISOC World Bank uh, uh, Fellowship. So um, the reason I applied for for the fellowship is because one it was inviting it actually gave a very good opportunity for people like me and especially people in the developing world to actually contribute and participate in forums like this because in forums like this there's very little participation from developing countries we hope that can improve and another thing is i'm very much interested in the internet i actually love i'm from a technical background so i'm involved my work involves daily just looking at reading about protocols, troubleshooting, network problems, and I'm very much interested in that. And But at a higher level, I'm also interested at the policy that actually goes into making the internet function the way it is, and therefore I saw the, an opportunity to attend and actually contribute to discussion that shapes, uh, that shapes uh, policy. So I would like to say uh, concerning the positive impacts of it, it is actually a very good program. I'll encourage many of you, perhaps when you maybe get to 20 years, like Becky, who to actually apply for it. It's you get to meet many people, especially people who uh, share certain values like you do. I, m one of my values is I actually uh, love an open internet the open architecture of the internet, I support uh, an open architecture. So you meet people who share certain values. You do get to network and collaborate, maybe in future projects. Um, the other thing I like to also stress is that 
as much as the Internet Society does give uh, the ambassadors this fellowship, there are requirements also when you're, comp when you're done with the fellowship. One of them is that you have to write a report. And you, another thing also the Internet Society requires you to do is to share experience with also your community. So I work also with the technical community, and I have to share my experience with them. Other than that, uh, in one of your questions, you mentioned about the negative, if there are any negative impacts of this. I wouldn't really say so. Maybe I'll just say that my, the challenges that ambassadors face, one of them is actually um, some new ambassadors may actually find uh, the jargon and also the ter terminologies used to be quite, you know, could be quite a mouthful. So. The, that's maybe the one adjusting perhaps to the to the meeting setup and also to what is being discussed is one of the maybe negative consequences uh, of perhaps let me not say it's so negative but it's just one of them of the challenges. Another thing also is uh, I like to mention is uh, you asked about what common reasons why people drop out. Well, I'll say that maybe the most common one is age, the age barrier. If you're over 40, I don't think you can apply for it. So that's what naturally uh, stops you from proceeding with the fellowship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just wondering, on, um, on a background standpoint, is uh, so from 20 to 40 years old, are there more students or are there more people who are working? Are there more people who are on with a technical background or without a technical background? Okay, um, most of the people, are, I'll say, are working professionals. Um, n they don't necessarily have to ha be from a technical background. We have quite a lot of people from who are lawyers, others who are in government. We have people also who are lecturers, academia. So it's actually diverse backgrounds from different parts of the world. And, uh, in which uh, is the other question? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great. Um, so what the, what are the um, so how's the actual format? So is there uh, is there going to be discussion preparation beforehand? Is there full time staff who will follow up with you? What are the resources that are devoted? Okay, so uh, basically. Um, there is preparation, pre-preparation, but this is usually done online because uh, we do preparation before we arrive at the venue. So we are briefed of what to expect and what is ISOC's uh, or the Internet Society's goals and aims in the IGF. The other thing also is uh, the Internet Society do send their staff. It's not just ambassadors who attend. They do send their staff because they play a very prominent role. The Internet Society was one of the organizations that championed the IGF during the WSIS, which is um, negotiations, or which, is one, which, is two, which is one and two. So they do play a very active role, and a good member, a good number of their staff actually uh, accompany ambassadors. Thank you so much. So, uh, lastly, on the internet governance uh, programs, we will have ICANN ambassador uh, Sirik. She is a remote participant. So uh, she is actually an ICANN fellow from Armenia. Is it um, is the is it working? Connecting. Okay. Okay. So so far with uh, all these um, internet um, governance discussion, I, I found some uh, quite common things uh, which we will discuss in the Q and A. Um, and I think the structure um, on the trainings, um, I think it might be better to just um, to divide into different age groups since I, I realize some are very, really young, uh, focus on you know, secondary school students um, and university students. Uh, some are actually for more professional uh, people. So I think ISOC would fall under the more professional and like the older category. And the trainings would be consequently very different. Uh, I think for the younger people, um, maybe we can go through a vote now while we are waiting for uh, her to connect. Um, do you think public speaking, um, I think as Lucinda has just said, public speaking would be a good topic to talk about uh, during um, training programs. Do you agree, disagree? So please show your sign. So yeah, I think um, 
So uh, a lot of people are uh, holding their red card. So I think a lot of majority of you just uh, agree with this statement. So what this means is I think um, IGF is predominantly in English, um, though we, we do have translations, but predominantly in English. And the um, confidence how you uh, portray other people, especially for younger participants, uh, is very important. So uh, I think yeah, China is doing a great job. <laughs> so so I think public speaking is important, and also think um, training on the the internet governance issues is important as well. Um, but it's just, I think, um, from what I've heard, it's not very specifically framed uh, internet governance. Or maybe we'll choose a specific topic. So for example, the center chose assess accessibility, um, privacy, uh, and this specific stream. And um, I think Namishin generally chose a broader topic. So, um, so maybe we should uh, decide on whether you think a more specific stream is more relevant or a more um, broader theme, for example, just talk about internet governance in general. So if you agree on a broader theme, uh, use your red card. If you agree on a more specific theme, use a white card. So this is kind of <laughs> undivided. So yeah, I think that, that probably goes to how, um, how much people know about the um, internet governance. And I think um, for NetMission, uh, since we're trained very broadly, uh, but then we're trained throughout like one year, I think it, it is good to um, you know, access all the different topics, but at the same time for, listen to for example, in ChildNet, uh, if they only have a summer camp, it's better to focus on something more technical. And uh, also on the selection of participants, I think there's a very general consensus uh, among all. Uh, that diverse background is actually the best. So it's not anyone very technical. Um, they can come from different schools, uh, especially somebody, um, as uh, he said, uh, out, even out of school, not even in the university. So do everyone agree on diverse, having a diverse participant in this um, internet governance discussion is, um, is a good thing? OK. So. Um, I think, yeah, so I agree. Um, I agree on the diversity. So also on the, um, on the topics that are, that are discussed, um, I think especially for youth um, or even anyone, you know, just make it as accessible and more relevant. So uh, do you have a comment? OK. So um, maybe click on you. Do you hear me? Hello. Oh. I'm not sure who has the other microphone. That's not me. Uh, sorry, she's the uh, person from the remote participant. Uh, Shirk, uh, maybe let, let, uh, let this participant on the floor uh, finish first, and then we'll go back to you. OK, please. Yes. Hello, I'm Martin. I'm uh, from the Web of Tomorrow's Yours. We're also having a side event for young people. We are not on the plenary. Maybe we can Next share year, our yeah. experience later. Yeah. Um, I, but I had a question on diversity, because now that you said diversity is an important factor, um, my impression is that we are actually only reaching out to the higher educated of that age group. I mean, there's early school leavers, there's people with only primary education. Um, like you said, you're, only, uh, you're basically addressing secondary education. There's people in apprenticeships from the age of 16. So there's a lot of more diversity that you can reach out on. I'm not sure, again, also about the white background. Um, and also that we have people that work with migrants a lot. Uh, we have uh, people from also very different backgrounds. Um, so how much diversity do we actually facilitate with these events? OK, so um, maybe that, that's a great topic to raise. Um, especially, I think a lot of our, our programs are outreach through school. So um, do people think school is a good way to recruit people who will be you know, engaged in this? Um, or do you think you know, maybe we should outreach to people from uh, maybe from the community center, if you can reach people who are doing internships, who are working? Uh, or migrants, uh, what do you think? So if you agree with school, uh, use the red. If you agree with, um, you know, like I reach to more people, uh, for example, um, wh what you've just said, people who are working, uh, migrants, and uh, people, other people with um, different backgrounds. Okay, so uh, there are people who uh, agree with, um, 
uh, reaching to people who have an even more diverse background, for example, reaching to internship and migrants. So uh, maybe perhaps can you share experiences in reaching out to them? And I guess school, why, why go with school is uh, one of them is one of the easiest because you can just talk to the school authorities and reach out to them on you know, having people apply. But um, how do you actually reach out to those people? Is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Our, our event is uh, quite differently structured uh, fr from the presented events. Um, we are building a lot of on representation, mm -hmm. um, and we use classical networks of youth organizations. So we are coming basically from a European umbrella, the European Youth Forum, which is um, um, an umbrella organization for the hundred biggest youth organizations in Europe. Um, for example, you say YCMA, uh, YMCA is part of uh, your support structures. The European YMCA organization is also part of the European Youth Forum. So basically, the way we reach out is uh, that we facilitate uh, the calls through the uh, network, which reaches ca can reach up to 100 million young people uh, in Europe. Um, uh, so that is the way that we disseminate the call. Um, our call is not that specific because we don't have the capacity uh, with the amount of applications to interview and uh, have debates like that. So basically what we are asking for is how they are involved in their organization because what we want to focus on is not just that people are in, uh, giving input to the event but also taking input from the event and bringing it back home to the organization. So how does their organization work with uh, internet governance is one of our questions. The other question is that they are supposed to check the program and then they give us uh, a a statement that how they would like to influence one of the workshops in the program and um, give us a statement what kind of input they would give so that we see uh, that they have the capacity to uh, um, present themselves in the workshops and also that they have a, a, a capacity to work on the topic. Um, so that's our general uh, process of, uh, of recruiting. We also have a small pre-event that depends on the funding. Um, our main difference, I guess, is that we are believing very strong in a youth-led approach. So all these organizations are exclusively led by young people. Um, young people, uh, according to the European def definition, from 14 to 30. Um, so basically, that is the age group that we are working with. And um, uh, we, we are trying always that the next uh, uh, event is organized by people from the previous event. So for example, I was uh, first active in the European Governance Forum, the Eurodic in 2010 uh, in, in uh, Bratislava, and then I was uh, organizing the follow-up in Stockholm uh, this year. And um, yeah, ba basically, the, so we try to have sustainable structures and we try, uh, try to create a network of these young people and their organizations that they can feed back to their, um, uh, to their organizations. For example, the first day of uh, the IGF, uh, we had also a workshop in uh, in Austria where young people came together and followed the live stream and discussed on the site the same topics after input from the IGF. And um, we do that uh, uh, several times. There will be also a, a, a common workshop for, pan uh, for European participants in spring and uh, also in Austria. Uh, there will be a workshop in Slovakia. Uh, Pavel here, he's from IG. He's also already uh, planning a workshop in Budapest, if I correctly understood. Um, but uh, so we, we try to know, have a reciprocal uh, process, not one way uh, we bring young people to the IGF, but also we bring IGF back to the young people. That's, uh, that's definitely a great way. Uh, maybe we'll go to the other participant, then go back to Sarik. I'll come to you, that's fine. Um, thank you, uh, Martin, for already explaining that. I want to I wanna keep it real here for a little bit, because um, Web of Yours Tomorrow, we try really hard. I was involved in Web of Yours Tomorrow as well, just like, the, uh, just like I was involved in the, in the Dutch IGF um, uh, meetings. Um, I want to say diversity and youth participation takes a lot of effort. You have to take it seriously if you really want to get diversity in. And I think we started working on it with the Web of Yours, is, uh, with the Web of Yours, but we got to keep it real and say we are not there yet by far. Uh, youth organizations that you know are involved are very good and, and some of them are very diverse but it's not all it, it's not everybody yet and um, I think honestly when it comes to the national IGFs as well as the international IGF here 
we got to make a choice. And we got to keep it real as well, you know? Not all young people wear suits and ties. Uh, there's young people with criminal records who need a second chance. Uh, for example, you know, uh, kids who, who, who did something wrong when it comes to internet and, and uh, you know, some crime-related stuff. We might want to give them a second chance because they have a lot of knowledge as well. But to do that, we need to get into, for example, the criminal system, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and talk to people there. Uh, so far, that has not been done by a single organization. Um, you know, when it comes to street kids, we need to get, get them involved a little bit more. Um, and that is something you cannot do one week ahead of the program or a month ahead of the program. That is something you cannot do with a call because it will not reach them. So that means you have to step inside of certain, um, you know, um, societies basically that you are not familiar with. That takes a lot of effort and it will take years and years and years to keep on doing that. Uh, it's up to us any organization who is involved in this session to really do that and uh, I would really you know would love to see people who, who want to do that and who want to do a little bit more than just saying okay this is a call and people can be involved that is not enough if you really want diversity you have to work on it really really hard for a long period and invest in it and so far I it agree it with your point has been a, it has been a little bit of a theater Okay, well, I agree with your point. I think we're on the process of uh, going there. I don't think, um, I think obviously, you know, there, there are people that they're reaching out to, and I think here it's a more general um, type of, uh, you know, just go through schools. And I think we're, we're working towards that um, state, but obviously we're not there yet. And we don't even have too many youth in the IGF, to be sure, right? So I think um, in the future, you know, I think that's definitely, for, for all the people who are here, you know, who might be, future coordinators who might be future participants they will keep that in mind you know like as in your thought but I don't don't think you're there yet and you're right about being real and keeping the people who should be uh, engaged so listen to one point and then we'll go to Sri Thank you, and I agree with that. I do think that we need to think about how we can be more broadly representative of young people. However, we were the first people to bring young people here. We did that in 2009. It's really encouraging to see more young people here this year. Our panel involved young people from the Nordic Youth IGF project and also the Anaxo Youth Panel, but it's really difficult. I come from an internet safety charity. Our focus is on lobbying in the UK on internet safety regulations. This is something we do at great cost to our Ourselves. In terms of, I've said before, you know, I'm a policy worker. My colleagues work in schools, so for them and for us, that is the way that we get young people. We would really love to issue a challenge, though, for other people who have the capacity and who have the funding and for whom that is a part of their world to engage in and to join the IGF. And we're very happy to support them in terms of sharing lessons that we've learned, the mistakes that we've made over the years, things that we've uh, found out that can actually make this easier for them if they do engage and join in but I don't think we should undermine the work of anyone who's A, sitting on the panel or B, who's worked really hard to get them there because this is actually, I think, a bit out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for the uh, engaged uh, discussion. So now we have to go back to our uh, presenters. So Sarik, she'll tell us a bit more about the ICANN um, fellow. No? Okay, maybe just later. So how about... Um, so now let's uh, yeah we can oh yeah hello everyone there I welcome all, all panelists and uh, people there in the room it's a little bit challenging to do presentation through this remote tool but I will try so uh, I'm Suranush Vardanyan representing uh, ICANN fellowship uh, uh, program and uh, I'm fellow uh, fellowship program alumni and I'm from Republic of Armenia. Um, I, I would present briefly what is ICANN fellow, uh, Fellowship Program and how you can be involved with it. So uh, the presentation, uh, I hope you can see presentation. Yes, we can. The yes, we can. Hello, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, excellent. So, um, 
I will go to the next line. So what is ICANN Fellowship? This is grant of support to individuals who are involved in any type of uh, IT issues or internet community. They can be uh, representative from government, from academia, from civil society, different constituencies. Uh, those people who are from developing countries and uh, are not able to participate uh, in ICANN meetings because of financial constraints. Um, as well, they should have a role or interest in internet space and are willing to use that experience uh, which they gain from the fellowship to become later a part of ICANN leadership. Uh, on the slide you can see statistics and uh, there is a link which you can go and view each fellowship program uh, by, uh, by meeting, by um, country representation there, by region, and by program process. Um, it's already five years uh, this uh, ICANN Fellowship program is on, so in Prague uh, this summer um, ICANN Fellowship um, was cele uh, celebrated its five years anniversary. Um, and uh, on the slide I just put uh, uh, which uh, says for itself that um, when I started uh, first in New Delhi, as a, uh, for me, this was just a place where I found myself lost, completely lost, uh, because there were um, so many new, to um, so many abbreviations there, so I thought I am not the, uh, in the right place. Um, but I uh, decided to go to the next meeting, even without any fellowship. Um, and I was in Paris, uh, started to find out a little bit more about different constituencies within ICANN. So it's, it's really very difficult. Um, Hi, Sirik. Actually, um, we can't, can't really hear you. And um, actually, in constraint of time, can you just um, uh, maybe I can ask you a couple questions and we can go through that quickly? Well, um, okay. I, I will just brief uh, tell you about the impact and how you can go and find information about the uh, fellowship program. So, um, this develop your own professional life. Uh, you can bring a new blood to ICANN. Mm -hmm. Privilege for young people to meet in art and um, you community while being once a fellow in ICANN. So you can bring that information and knowledge back to your community, which is one of the important aspects of uh, this fellowship program. Um, and uh, you just on the slide see the names of many of them are currently in person um, in Baku. So about ICANN fellowship. Um, and they are representing uh, different constituencies and uh, different leadership positions now within ICANN. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so let's move to um, youth engagement outside of internet governance, uh, Joshua. Uh, so he's a convener of scholarism in Hong Kong, uh, which is a social movement. So maybe you can tell us a bit more how to engage young people. Um, I'm Joshua Wong, 16 years old, a secondary five student came from Hong Kong. And I'm also the convener of Scholarism. Scholarism is a student organization that involved in a student movement to object to the national education that proposed by Hong Kong government. Why well, today I will give a sharing here because I think that uh, for the previous months or in the summer holiday, Scholarism have organized a 100 uh, 20,000 people to occupy Hong Kong government headquarters and 90,000 people to join the rally. And I think it's really a huge amount of people to participate in a social movement, especially a lot of youth students participate in it. And social media, Facebook and YouTube is the key point or the tools for us to spread our idea. Um, before we have, uh, we use social media to voice out our opinion to or promote our uh, event. 
I think that um, social media can let us to reach the people that we cannot reach before. And it can also cover the things that me uh, mass, me mass media that cannot cover. And um, say for example, for uh, when we have occupied the government headquarters, also have free secondary school students, they have hunger strike to object the national education. Uh, most of the mass media will just focus on how a uh, student they join into the hunger strike, but uh, those, uh, say for example, newspaper or TV, first, um, youth or teens, they may not like to bring by a p by newspaper or watch TV news, they will just browse into the internet and we will post our uh, declaration of why we need to join into the hunger strike and a lot of detailed information will be given in our Facebook page and our Facebook page has uh, about 16,000 people to f uh, like it and it's also another media for us to propose our idea and our value. Uh, yeah, you're right. I think engaging uh, youth, especially through social media, um, we'll, get, we'll get back to you and uh, you as well. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, are there any ca um, youth programs on the panel here that engages social media in um, you know, speaking to, um, uh, reaching out to the people um, that um, are engaged? Um. Uh, anyone on the panel? So uh, Anna Marie, and then oh, okay. How about you? okay? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just go. Okay. Quickly, uh, Student IGF has a Facebook, and we post things on it that uh, Flores and I are doing this week, and nice photos. That's about it. So, um, Abaka, do you want to make a point? <laughs> Thank you. Um, at ChildNet, we did a survey that we sent out to a lot of young people across England and, well, across the world, really. And um, for us personally, like me and Jack, distributed that survey across Facebook. We then to our friends, our friends forwarded it from there. And that's how we got a lot of young people in the UK involved in taking part in our survey, which we have read a lot of statistics out at this conference. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I think social media is another uh, point that we, we do agree on, but we'll go uh, come back in the Q&A. Um, so how about Amelia? Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more on how you engage uh, young people online. Um, so yes, um, my name is Amelia Andersdotter. I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, on behalf of the Pirate Party, which means that my position, I guess, in terms of governance is quite different from many other people on the panels. My primary task in the upcoming years will be to make laws that regulate how different actors in society that are involved with internet governance actually are allowed to exist or not, and if so, under which conditions and with which methods can they operate. Uh, I use social media a lot. I try to reach out to uh, my constituents with social media, but I find very often when you, as somebody in an influential position, use social media like Facebook or uh, Twitter, it becomes a monologue, uh, monologue um, kind of communication tool, as in I broadcast information to the outside world about um, the activities that I do and then I hope that somebody will be interested enough to retweet it. But the actual dialogue maybe is not so easy to create in those forums. And if you do create a dialogue or if you post something which might be slightly inappropriate or seen as kind of, oh, this was very provocative or not very political of you, it's just a YouTube video, or it's the wrong YouTube video, like I don't like the song, I end up in a lot of trouble because a lot of people don't have very high barriers for telling me in such words um, that they thought that I made a very good, very bad public advocacy choice in that instance. Um, now, what I see with internet governance and in, in general with youth participation or even any kind of civil society participation in, in kind of the legislative framework that we anyway all have to relate to somehow, 
um, is that we have a, a lack of action in the political field, as in we have very s extreme difficulties determining whether or not we have any ideological processes backing backing these governance proceedings that, and discussions? Um, if so, who holds which ideological positions? Are they aware of this? Can they identify them? I often, in my em environment in the parliament, I'm not sure if I actually disagree with somebody, even though I am clearly seen as a very opposition kind of party from a marginal kind of political movement in a small member state of the north of Europe. Um, and this can be extremely frustrating. If I was going to really address internet governance, I, I would look somewhere there. Like, do we have frameworks for these debates at all politically? Also, um, the in terms of participation in internet governance forum, I very much like being here. I see it as a nice way of seeing loads of projects where people get involved. Also in terms of youth participation, it's incredibly inspiring to know what they're doing in Hong Kong. I think it's really a really, really brilliant activity, but I see not so much reverberation of this activity into my legislative institution. Not maybe because my legislative institution isn't um, young enough to interface with this, although we also have very many older deputies, um, but maybe more because there's a lack of interfaces between um, civil society at large and the legislative institutions, and maybe that's because civil society normally doesn't fear as much um, the ideological principled discussion as much as the legislative institution fears them. Um, yeah, so, th those uh, are great points. What I would like to see discussed more, also in terms of youth participation, is when can you make um, strong kind of political statements about how we want the regulatory framework to look? Because this is actually an urgent issue at this time. The multi-stakeholder model for internet governance and kind of these discussion forums I think are fine, but in terms of the European Union, for instance, we also have some very difficult legislative problems that we need to solve. And, and they need to be addressed. We need to introduce some political kind of society values back into the governance discussions and decide if we want to go somewhere or not. Maybe the IGF would not be the optimal forum for that ultimate targeting of the political discussion, but at least in terms of the European Union, I, I don't see how we will build a future ignoring that there is a legislative framework for this because there is and we need to change it so thank you Amelia that's a great point um, so Anne-Marie do you have a question yeah I have a question for Amelia because uh, um, I was wondering if you have any suggestions or ideas about how uh, the opinions of young people can influence policies so that's a very good question. Um, normally what I see is the problem when I try to interface with people outside of the parliament is that there's extreme cynicism about the efficiency in doing so. As in, if I actively go hunt for young people to ask their opinion, they will often tell me that I'm wasting my time, that my influence anyway is neglig negligible, I don't deserve my wages, I travel too much, and I don't care about them. And this like extreme, there's like, uh, an, an, an interface problem where they don't see really the value uh, of me. But I think more, uh, more young people and more people in general need to actively communicate to their deputies that they require their deputies to express also political opinions. We're not only looking for consensual models um, where the, the, and, and endless discussions which kind of get lost in these like technical details or like oh it's very complicated and it's better to stay neutral but maybe we actually want our pu public representative to at some point say actually we like the idea of open communication we could see our public representative saying this in public or in media and also in the European Parliament we would like for our public representatives to take the legislative work that they're undertaken seriously and express a preference in terms of um, who will control the communication flows on the internet. We like human rights on the internet, of course we do, and now we need for our public representatives to explain how will they ensure that the human rights online actually, um, actually will, and, and this type of interaction with the policymakers, always asking them to actively take positions, because that way I would like to believe politicians would feel compelled to satisfy their electorate by taking such positions. 
at least this is somehow the way it's supposed to work. So Thank mm, you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that, that's a great point. So I think tying back to, um, you know, policy making, you know, if I just want to pose a question to other organizers, if uh, policy making is a state that you would eventually want them to be engaged in for internet governance, um, perhaps admin, he's a... Uh, I apologize because uh, I was listening online and it's like um, 10 seconds delay and uh, <laughs> so I was just trying to follow the, the discussion. But um, I, I certainly think that uh, uh, having influence in policy decision process is, uh, should be a motivator for uh, uh, engaging youth and, and, and the youth programs. And that's one of the reasons why I, I guess um, we, we try to bring uh, our well, net mission and uh, other uh, program to to ICANN meetings as well. And uh, one of the biggest difference between, I guess, here at IGF and and at ICANN, I, I kind of say that um, ICANN uh, is sort of the multi-stakeholder uh, internet governance uh, in action, uh, and policy decisions are being made there and are being implemented and. Um, uh, the 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 challenge, as as Amelia says, is that um, there's always the 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 immediate um, uh, I guess knee jerk reaction that uh, this is this is too complicated, this is this is too technical, uh, and the people at ICANN doesn't help <laughs> uh, in that regard as well. A lot of the discussions, especially the more intensive. Uh, policy discussions are often filled with jargon and also often filled with the 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 history behind the the issues uh, which newcomers or especially younger uh, uh, person coming into to the room find very difficult for them to even you know even though they might have an opinion they might be worried about you know has this been said before it, how how does this reflect on me uh, you know when is is this a stupid question those kind of issues but but <coughs> the overall i think um having a a, a an in, you know a a clear influence in the policy decision process would certainly be be a motivator okay so how about um maybe we can ask bill on the panel do you have any views on you know if youth participation programs and internet governance is eventually um, working towards this policy making or policy influence on policy um, state. Thank you. Um, I've been teaching university courses about uh, global governance of information and communication technology since 1987. So you may be wondering what I'm doing on this panel. Um, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the old man of the sea here. Um, and I quite, I'm not entirely quite sure what I'm doing on the panel now, now that I've been here. Um, but I will say this, uh, I, I certainly, it, the things that I've heard being talked about are very exciting. I think it's very promising to see this level of engagement. I'm not terribly well familiar with the particular programs that have been under discussion, but they sound uh, like very good initiatives that should be built out more. Obviously, if um, young people want to uh, weigh in on internet governance processes, there are a number of steps that have to be taken to get to the point where they'll be effect effective. Um, one, of course, would be to start by identifying what are the issues, the distinctive points uh, where they really want to weigh in, and what type of forums and institutions are the most appropriate for them. Uh, I think as somebody who's active in ICANN, like Edmund, in a, in a policy uh, context, um, you know, a lot of the issues we deal with I, within ICANN may not be the most immediately salient to young people relative to a lot of other things. I mean, I'm, uh, we're, we're not dealing with uh, privacy on Facebook or freedom of expression uh, or things like that. We're dealing with uh, often quite technical issues around the management of, you know, uh, internet resources. Um, and I do think that those issues have strong public interest dimensions, 
uh, which young people, like all people, should be uh, interested in and engaged on, but getting to the point where you're able to identify what it is exactly about those issues that would make you want to in intervene, um, it, you know, that takes some work. And so that's why I think, uh, obviously, another, uh, another step that has to be pursued is uh, precisely the kind of thing you're doing, which is to train up uh, and get exposed and, and uh, uh, learn the issues. My own view as somebody who teaches internet governance uh, at both an undergraduate and graduate level and has also been involved in various training programs, including the summer school on internet governance, both the one in Europe and the one in Latin America, um, is that, from my standpoint, I guess, teaching um, is better than training, uh, which is to say, um, I think that there's a lot more to be gained from ongoing, iterative, intensive interaction with um, uh, quality uh, education that's presented in a pedagogically structured way rather than, um, you know, a lot of times training courses are just kind of quick one-offs and people come in, they, they, give, they give their talk about something and they, they leave and it's kind of hard for people to know what exactly to take from that. Um, so I think, you know, but I, training plays a role, but it's a compliment to me uh, to other things. I, I would also say uh, personally that I think face-to-face uh, uh, is of greater value generally than virtual, although I think I've been teaching on the internet since 1996. Um, I tend to think of it better as an adjunct to face-to-face -face teaching rather than a complete substitute. Um, that's not because I'm an old guy who's afraid of being disintermediated. Um, I'd be happy to work at home in my pajamas uh, if they would allow me to teach all my courses online. Uh, that that'd be fine with me. Uh, but it's just it's. A, I think that really, you know, when you're dealing with complex issues like this, real mentoring, um, intensive dialogue, ongoing engagement, sustained relationships with people who are trained and know how to teach, are the things that will really help you to position yourself to be able then to come into these forums and uh, face the kinds of challenges that, that Edmund faces, which are not limited to young people, by the way, and I'll, I'll stop in a second. Um, you know, the, the challenges uh, that Edmund mentions, uh, whether it's an ICANN or any of the other more technical kinds of bodies of like, you know, you come into a process and you don't know this has been, there's, some, there's been a six year discussion and you're just cutting into it and you're trying to figure out how to say something that does, hasn't already been talked about and dismissed and you don't want to sound dumb and all that, that applies to everybody. <laughs> everybody so, uh, who comes into these things faces that. So students will need that. You, young people will need to do the work to get themselves in a the position to challenge these things. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we, we have um, people on the floor who are um, interested to speak. So. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So please keep it short because uh, we, we do need to come back to the consensus part. So go ahead. Okay, I've got a short question, but yeah. I think I hopefully have I will get a long answer. My name is Thor Spass. I'm from the uh, Dutch IGF, and I'm a student as well. And so far, we've only heard about raising awareness among youth itself. But how do you raise awareness among uh, the people on the IGF as youth participants? So how do we raise awareness among adults? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a question to the panelists. How do you do it? Is there anyone on the panel? So there's a follow-up question in the back. Uh, in the meanwhile, I can uh, talk to you a bit more about. Um, so I think they're increasing. I've been in IGF for three years, and I think they're increasing more and more youth uh, from all, all over the world who are participating. So I think Lucinda, she brought Tana here uh, um, four years ago. Uh, yeah, and then um, there's gradually more and more youth. So for example, uh, the Dutch delegation, the Nordic youth delegation. Um, I think raising uh, it to other adults, uh, there was a youth coalition on internet governance. So I think um, they made uh, actually a statement um, in Lithuania um, on you know how important to have youth uh, to be on the panel. And I also thought um, there are a lot of uh, youth uh, actually speaking uh, in different panels. Um, although there might not be a panelist, um, they would be speaking on the floor. On um, I think that really helps them to raise the profile. 
uh, for general uh, IGF participants uh, and them to understand uh, how, how important to have youth uh, be on the panel or even contributing their voice. So follow-up question? Hi. Do you hear me? Yeah, we do. Okay. So uh, actually, thanks for uh, giving the floor now because I'm exactly speaking on behalf of the Youth Dynamic Coalition. So I'm going from comments to an invitation. Uh, first, uh, since uh, Sirik was breaking the, the call, uh, as also an ICANN Fellowship Program alumni, I would like you to encourage, uh, I'm not sure if it, uh, you got the idea, but the ICANN Fellowship Program gives you a home. So when you, you come to the ICANN meeting and you got overwhelmed with the acronyms and with the several constituencies they are breaking through, uh, you can go back to this home which are uh, this community with fellows under the same grounds and uh, you can ask, well, why the, uh, what does ICANN stand for? And you don't feel like a stupid question. But anyway, uh, just to make this short comment. But about the Youth Then I'm Collision, uh, uh, two, three years ago we created this uh, this coalition exactly to merge all the initiatives. So I, I think the, the, the Dutch IGF guy were talking also about new grounds that need to be explored. And uh, that's the idea. The, the name Dynamic Coalition stands for uh, this merging process where uh, uh, all the, the initiatives, child net, net mission and so on could uh, merge and create new, uh, new challenges, new um, new activities that youth could be undertaking. I think we do have, like, um, I could capture from the discussions three, at least three categories that we needs to be tackled from raising awareness, real engagement, and effective, uh, meaningful participation. So I, I think those are the points w we need to, to be tackling uh, in, in uh, other areas. And the invitation, I'm sorry, I'm just speaking too fast, so I, I, I don't consume the, the time for the consensus building, but uh, we are going to hold a meeting for the Youth Dynamic Collisions tomorrow at 1 p.m. room 7. So it would be nice to have you around and uh, so we could uh, discuss the new uh, challenges that we are going to undertake for uh, and remembering that IGF is not a single event but a process. So what we are going to do from now uh, to the next IGF in Indonesia. Uh, should we work more on social media? Um, uh, I agree. Thank you so much. Um, so, okay, so let's go to the consensus, uh, which I think it's important in this uh, session before we end. Uh, we are running a little late. Um, so, on the organizer perspective, um, the design of the structure. So, um, I, I, I think Bill's point is very uh, accurate on teaching is over training. So teaching throughout a longer period of time versus training, uh, one, those are one-off training. So who agrees teaching is better or training is better? So please show your hands. Please vote. Okay, so I do see a lot of uh, pink and a lot of uh, yellow. So maybe I think um, eventually, I th um, if we have the resources, teaching is definitely better. But um, on training, you know, somehow it's more effective, and sometimes it's a, a mixture of both. Uh, it depends on the length of the program, um, and also um, so on the selection of participants. Um, I think it, it has we have built a consensus on uh, that we agree we need a lot of diverse uh, people who are uh, interested in internet governance and just engage them uh, regardless of their backgrounds. Um, so I think, don't think there's a general, um, there is any common background of them at any stage of life. Um, and it depends on how the program is also structured. Uh, for example, some are structured uh, for school students, uh, some are structured for um, you know, working individuals, so for example, in the ISOC, uh, because they target 20 to 40 years old. Um, so on the topic selection, uh, I think a lot of us select a wide range of topics, and we have also uh, agreed on um, depends on the education level, um, how much they can engage in, and how much they read on this topic, um, on you know, how specific it is, and how less, um, how broad uh, internet governance can be framed. And uh, finally, on the resources devoted, uh, I find programs, um, for example, ChildNet and NetMission, who has been going on for uh, a couple of years, um, they usually have somebody, um, for example, Lucinda or Edmund or Elaine, who actually uh, look after the events or like a full-time staff. Uh, You're a full-time staff? 
Yeah, full-time staff who actually look after the event. Uh, of course, I think youth-led is a great idea, um, as mentioned uh, over there. Uh, but I think youth-led does have its challenges. Um, but I think eventually we should move some uh, somewhere between a youth-led uh, and then a support uh, from uh, the uh, organizers uh, as in terms of funding or even in terms of knowledge. Um, so, um, and also have a point on... Um, it's very important to sustain, especially I think um, net mission. We do our community projects, then come. Um, for example, uh, you usually let um, bring the knowledge back to your own countries, and uh, I think Sunik, uh, uh, who was a ICANN fellow, she also mentioned that she bring the um, ICANN experience back to her own country. So I think it's important to be sustainable when you want to have leaders in this field uh, to eventually have um, them organize other things. Um, is this a general consensus? That's just something I agree. So um, please use your cards. Um, as in, you know, having follow-up actions after you attended this uh, training program or this uh, ambassadorship. So yeah, again, I see a lot of pink. Um, <coughs> also yellow over there um, on you know how uh, how important follow up uh, following up is. And um, I think collaboration partners uh, for Hong Kong. It's better to have, you know, for example, a reputation, a reputable organization, especially on uh, such an issue that's not very well known. Um, I'm not sure about other countries. So, um, do you think having a reputable partner, for example, an NGO or a school, is important, or do you think just, you know, um, net mission by itself is sufficient? So, partnership. Um, I see a lot of pink as well, so I, I think partnership with uh, reputable organizations is important as well. So uh, when it goes to the participants, um, I think why join, part of it is because of interest, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, again, I think uh, things that would have attracted you, I think better profiling, um, you know, the engagement in the uh, discussion, networking is another thing. Um, so maybe on the panel, or any youth uh, down there, um, maybe can you tell me if you agree on uh, the th three points that I've mentioned. So um, the inspiration, uh, the profiling, as well as the networking. So the panelists vote. Well, maybe I have not so much a remark uh, on this, but a proposition that might be a little daring and by no means want to offend anyone, but maybe for uh, next IGF we should think about a workshop that um, is on where only uh, young people uh, or students are allowed to make any comments and adults and uh, people of organi uh, organizing people can, of course, uh, come and are very welcome, but uh, know that the discussion is really about um, among young people because I think that will create a different discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So I think tomorrow a Youth Dynamic Coalition would definitely um, foster that. Um, and on uh, engaging people through social media, so I think Chartnet um, as well as uh, the Dutch uh, student IGF uh, both engage people through Facebook and I think that's a quite an effective way so if you agree, uh, use your pink. If you don't agree, use your white. Uh, maybe, I, I just wanted to know, it's quite interesting how you guys use Facebook, yet you don't really, it's quite neutral. So maybe you can make a comment on that. Um, it wasn't actually ChildNet as an organization that used um, Facebook to network. It was me and Jack sharing out some of the research we were conducting on, like, we were doing it to further our knowledge as part of ChildNet. It wasn't them as a co corporation who was doing that. Oh, okay, okay. Understand. Um, so, but then you do, do not use, is there a Facebook page for ChildNet? Uh, It's just been very difficult for us to get people to engage with the Facebook page. It, it's been there for four years. Um, it's got about 350 likes now, but um, mm -hmm. we get more traction, particularly when we were sending out the survey. We had to do it through contacts internationally that we had. Um, we put it on the Facebook page, but it wasn't picked up. Oh, okay. 
So I think maybe on a personal standpoint, it will be easier. But for our organization, I think it's uh, less, uh, l less effective uh, that way. Um, so on a uh, common challenges that we face, I think jargon is what definitely one uh, for you to engage in this. And also, I think moving, moving forward, uh, uh, engaging in the policy making is uh, another one that I've identified. So do people in the crowd agree with um, these two? So jargon as well as uh, the policy making part, you know, taking, bringing this forward. So okay, I see a lot of uh, generally uh, uh, pink uh, paper, so they agree. Um, so on, um, um, and I think concluding, right, uh, what we are working on uh, for internet governance uh, youth programs, or in, in general in youth programs, um, we want more diverse people to be uh, engaged in this conversation, uh, regardless of their background, and we also want to move towards the policy making, which is a tougher, but also I think a more fruitful discussion uh, for youth to be engaged and for people actually to get something out of youth participation. So uh, thank you very much for everyone on the panel as well as everyone on the floor. Um, thank you for you know, uh, raising what you think. Um, and we, we do want to um, grab you off offline uh, for a more thorough discussion. Thank you very much.